Peter Warren Singer, uh, is a strategist and senior fellow at New America and one of the nation's leading futurists, I would say futurists slash strategists. Uh, he's been uh, named one of the na nation's 100 leading, leading innovators by Defense News, uh, as one of the 100 most influential people in defense issues by uh, foreign policy, also has been on the 100 uh, global thinkers list. And I love this particular distinction. He is named as an official mad scientist for the US Army's Training and Doctrine Command. Uh, and he's written multiple award-winning and best-selling books. His partner in crime, August Cole, uh, is an author exploring the future of conflict through fiction and other forms of storytelling. We think of this as the Beyond the White Paper project. Uh, he's a non-resident senior fellow at the Sco Brent Scowcroft Center for, uh, on Strategy and Security at the Atlantic Council. Uh, and a non-resident fellow at the Brute Krulak Center for Innovation and Creativity at the Marine Corps University. Uh, he works also on creative futures at Spark Cognition, which is an artificial intelligence company, and we'll be talking a lot more about AI. So Peter and August uh, have collaborated before their last novel, which was called Ghost Fleet, uh, a novel of the next world war, uh, was a best-selling page turner, and I can say that personally, having devoured it. It is now uh, on virtually every commander's list uh, in the US military and read around the world. So we're delighted uh, to have Peter and August join us. Before we jump in, uh, I wanna thank our event partner, Slate, and also tell you that you can purchase your own copy of the book, uh, Burn In, uh, from our bookselling partners, Solid State Books. So with that, uh, let us talk about Burn In, uh, a novel of the real robotic revolution. We originally just titled this event a, a, a discussion of the book, but over the weekend and particularly after yesterday, we've retitled it Dystopia in America because many of us feel like we're living uh, not in a novel, but in a, a, a piece of dystopian fiction. A dystopia is, unlike a utopia, is a fictionalized version of a nightmare world where things that shouldn't be possible are possible. And honestly, watching the president last night uh, push aside and disrupt a peaceful protest to march across uh, Lafayette Park to a church uh, where he wanted, where he said to the nation, he stood with peaceful protesters was like watching something out of 1984. Uh, so many of us really do feel like we're living in a dystopia. And I want to start by, by asking you, uh, and August, I'll start with you. What's the value of, of describing this kind of a world in fictional form? Well, thank you, uh, Anne-Marie, for hosting us. And my heart goes out to the protesters last night and, uh, and other communities who are trying to make sense of the not just the last 24 hours, but the last week. And we are at this point in which the things that we often, and I say this as an optimist who stares into the abyss, the things that we want to not see come true are coming true with too much regularity. And the value of exploring those kinds of dystopian alternatives to today set in the future I think require us to confront those very scenarios we want to avoid. And importantly, from a, from a character-driven perspective, you know, you know, if you can do that, you have a chance at creating more empathy and connection and understanding and, perhaps, and uh, ultimately avoiding the, the kinds of uh, scenarios that many of us you know, lie awake at night trying to, to make sense of. You know, looking at how we often consider the future, it's often binary in terms of being utopian or dystopian, but the reality is in fact, it can be gray. There, there's a in between. And, and though there are acute moments of, of abhorrent either behavior or things that we see, the, the, the really interesting aspect, I think, to trying to figure out the sorts of tomorrows that lie ahead are, I often go back to a quote that William Gibson, the science fiction writer had said, which is that the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. 
and that's particularly true with technology in the way that it is uh, changing our daily world, our discourse, uh, but also real world uh, actions. And so as we try to, to plot our way ahead here after the past week, I think we're going to have to squarely confront uh, the idea that tomorrow is not better than today. And, and out of that, though, hopefully be able to connect with one another and coming up with some better alternatives so that we can at least uh, avoid those sorts of dystopian tomorrows that, that uh, uh, right now feel like like the present. I, I I like the that point that that um, you know that tomorrow may not be but that only by really facing honestly uh, a worse future we possibly avoid it. Just to, we I often talk about the critical importance of radical honesty in facing the past. So that right now when we are grappling with the horrific murder of George Floyd. We also see that as part of a much larger pattern and not just a pattern of police brutality, uh, but also a, 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 as part of a, a past of systemic racism, which we're also seeing play out uh, in the disparity in the number of deaths uh, from COVID, where uh, essentially uh, African Americans, Latinx Americans are dying at much, much greater numbers. So we often do talk about radical honesty and facing the past to be able to, to imagine and create a better future. But here we also need to look at alternate futures in the same way. So Peter, let me turn to you to ask you to, to reflect on that. You're muted, Peter. <laughs> uh, it's really difficult to uh, reflect. I think like so many others right now, I'm filled with a sort of um, churning turmoil of emotions. There's, um, as August said, there's appreciation to um, you, New America, everyone who supported this project. It's a multi-year project uh, and to see it uh, finally come out and be able to talk about it um, is, you know, appreciation, there's pride. But like so many others right now, I'm filled with a mix of um, uh, sadness and anger. Um, and it's anger and sadness at what we see uh, our nation suffering, what we see our sisters and brothers suffering. And then it even comes down to the personal level. Uh, the church um, that uh, that took place at St. John's, um, it's, you know, literally down the street from uh, New America. But it's also a church that I have family members that are members of. I've gone to um, multiple uh, weddings and, and on the other side, funerals at it. And um, as one of them uh, said to me last night, uh, what they saw was, quote, the height of hypocrisy using the church as a photo op. And um, that, you know, is, is what we see right now is sort of filled with all of that. And um, so, and as August said, uh, that's not going to go away. Um, the crises that we face are a uh, combined health crisis, there is an economic crisis, and there's also a political crisis, and they're not going away. Um, now, there's an irony uh, that at the moment when we feel um, sort of dystopia coming true, um, that's actually when dystopian fiction can be most useful. And it's actually when people strangely, but it makes sense, turn to it the most. Uh, we've seen, um, you know, a bookstore owners uh, and online vendors talk about they've seen a surge in sales of both dystopian classics. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've been in a couple of weeks of um, uh, a, a pandemic, um, you know, a hundred years of solitude, uh, its sales are spiking right now. Um, but it's also been uh, newer projects as well, um, you know, not just ours, but you think of Lawrence Wright's project on a pandemic. Um, there's a history behind this. Uh, actually, during World War II um, in Great Britain, um, during, you know, actual rationing, as opposed to what we have right now, uh, book sales actually doubled. Um, and uh, in fact, the um, Book Society, uh, which was you know Britain's version of like Oprah's book list back in the day, um, said that uh, books' power to take people other places meant they were quote more necessary than gas masks. Um, but as August said, it's it's not just the escapism; it's also the idea that dystopian uh, fiction can be um, educational; that it can serve a purpose. Um, it might be a uh, warning, um, as Sinclair Lewis uh, did in 1935, um, it can't happen here, maybe it could. Uh, and that's also a book whose sales has surged. 
um, to you think of, you know, Margaret Atwood's uh, work um, and how it's a Handmaid's Tale, how it's become more relevant. Um, and one of the things that, that you know, uh, August has, has put really well is um, that all dystopian writers are, are secret optimists. Um, that's why we do it. Uh, yeah. We do it because we um, want to uh, educate, warn of what might come if things go too far. Uh, so the idea is that it's not just an act of um, prediction, but of prevention. And that's what we've you know, been feeling uh, swirling around us. We hope this uh, book can be escapist for people, but also that it um, can serve a purpose. It can be useful fiction. Uh, and it, whether it's um, in depicting certain trends that we're seeing play out right now, um, you know, the, there's a moment in the book uh, where it talks about the security perimeter of the White House being pushed past where it had been previously. It took one week for the book to be out for that to happen, right? Wow. <laughs> um, but, but I guess, you know, so our hope is that uh, it can serve that dual purpose of entertainment, but also education, and in a way that hits harder than an op-ed or a PowerPoint, because um, narrative is the oldest technology for communication. So that's a great moment uh, to, to turn to the technological dimensions uh, of, of this dystopia. And, and I'll say there, again, living through COVID and people have been writing that we're, we're living through a combination of 1918, 1933, and 1968 all rolled into one terrifying ball. Uh, but it, it, when we think about the impact of COVID, one of the things we've seen very clearly is the technological divide, uh, again, largely tracking a race and uh, economic divide where the disease itself is affecting uh, black and brown Americans who are much more likely still to have to be on the front lines in essential work or they have to take uh, public transportation. They don't have the same health care, health care and health insurance, uh, nor the same ability to insulate themselves from the virus. But equally importantly, once schools moved online and work moved online, Many of us, as we are now participating in a Zoom webinar, simply went virtual. But so many other Americans can't go virtual. They don't have access to high quality broadband. And to do a Zoom, you, you really need fast uh, quality broadband, which means now that, that they cannot even participate uh, in school, uh, in elementary school, much less, less higher education. So there's been a clear technological uh, dimension there. And at the same time, when through these, the, the, the riots that we've seen, the, the, um, just the agony of uh, recognizing the murder of George Floyd and others, I keep thinking as I look at like riot lines and other things, I keep thinking, where's the humanity here? Where, how, do we, how do we grab onto the humanity? And your book actually gets at both of those things, right? It, it looks at humanity and technology and coming together. So I want to turn to talking about it. I have to ask you, first of all, whichever is true, which of you came up with the title? That's August. He gets credit for that. <laughs> okay. So, uh, all right. So then I get to ask August. So August, burn in. What is it? We are right now at the precipice of a transformational moment with uh, artificial intelligence and robotics. And that's not just in the way that it's usually talked about in terms of uh, you know, creating new markets or conveniences. Rather, all of society is about to undergo, and as, as we've seen, I think right now, in the midst of beginning uh, an experiment of sorts. And the phrase burn in is used often in the engineering or software communities to describe the initial testing and experimentation that goes with, let's say, the servos on a robot, that you're trying to kind of work them until they break. And it felt like in looking at some of the trends we were seeing that, uh, technologically, as you mentioned, that will exacerbate inequality, whether it's the rise of gig work, whether it is the virtualization of real world privilege in society, uh, whether it is the rise of extremism at the highest levels of politics. 
that we are in effect in the midst of a burn-in with these transformational technologies. And it's difficult as someone who likes to see the possibility of great transformation for good, that technology can be used in that way. But I can't help but acknowledge and, and really dive into the risks that we're courting as we blindly embrace these futures because we don't realistically envision the sorts of narratives that are more likely, I think, to, to come true. And, and there's some perspective, I think, from, from Ghost Fleet in our experience, which was to look at the discussion and discourse around the rise of China uh, and looking at data and, and, and policy and other trends that to us indicated a much more frank and, and concerning assessment of the, the nation state's ambitions in the Asia Pacific and globally. And, and looking even at what the assumptions were in the part of the US defense community, but also within China. For example, the end of the Communist Party. Uh, the over-reliance on technological systems uh, in the U.S. Uh, defense community were two big uh, kind of cornerstones of that world that we built. So with burn-in, we're trying to also unpack similar trends that we feel don't get enough attention. And in terms of the economic and social vulnerability that's extant today, made worse by the pandemic, uh, will be made worse this summer as the unemployment that we see as bad as the Great Depression isn't going to be alleviated by any sort of federal programs that I can see is, is doing anything significant. Uh, those jobs aren't going to come back in the same way. And in fact, the uptick and uptake of technologies that allow virtualization may mean some of them never do. And yet we're not ready as a society to have a debate about what it means to be an American in a world where work isn't easily accessible, where it may not even define you socially, uh, and where it is not the sort of uh, tomorrow that people actually look forward to. And, and I, you know, I think about this as I sat last night watching the news with my children trying to explain uh, what, what is ahead for them? And it's a very difficult conversation to have to both keep them feeling like they have agency and choice in their future, but also not to induce the sort of helplessness that I fear a too dystopian outlook or too dystopian uh, worldview can, can, can uh, promote. Because we do have a choice. We have, we have to act and, and take responsibilities with it wherever they present. Um, but the future is ours if we, if we can so choose. If I can jump in, you know, so uh, August gets the, the front title, I get the subtitle. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's also a deliberate choice that, that answers some of your question. Um, so the subtitle is a novel of the real robotic revolution. And the real aspect is because um, we are on the 100 year anniversary of the creation of the word robot itself. Uh, it was in a 1920 play that was early science fiction. And um, ever since that um, word and how it's depicted uh, carries through in, in sci-fi. So it's the idea of a um, mechanical servant who wises up and then rises up, you know, and you get the kill all humans moment. Um, and that runs through all of sci-fi, but it's also um, captured the popular imagination uh, as well as even how we think about it in the policy world. Uh, you think about everything from the um, discourse around killer robots uh, which has been talked about everywhere from the United floor of the United Nations to Pentagon policy. Um, you think about the literal $5 billion that was spent um, on investment on existential threats from AI and robots um, to you think about the Secretary of the Treasury saying, you know, this stuff with AI and automation, it's not going to be an issue for, quote, 50 to 100 years. It's way off in the future. And yet what's happening is rather it's not a robot revolt we're living through a robotics revolution. We're living through an industrial revolution. We're living through AI, robotics, all these advanced technologies, internet of things, rewiring our economy and everything that flows out from it, our society, our politics, um, security, national security down to cybersecurity in your home, um, even your family life. And as you know, Gibson put it, you have this, this uneven distribution and some of that might be the way he was framing it of some technologies here, some's not, but you also have the uneven distribution of um, who gets the fruits and the costs of it. Economic revolutions have winners and they have losers and they play out again at the individual level, certain jobs, certain professions doing better, other not so much certain communities having access to it, others not. So, you know, we depict what Washington DC will be like 15 years from now. And, you know, you have some areas where there's lots of internet accessibility, um, advanced AI, mass surveillance, and then you have other kind of dead zones where it's people who've been left behind electronically. 
Um, it also means that you have regional differences. We see this in the economy right now, who's thriving from the new economy or not. And that of course plays out in new political and legal questions. And that's what we wanted to do with the book is um, you know, explore this in, in a way that's different from most of the fiction, but using real world research to carry it through. So you know, baked into the story is 300 explanations and predictions of this world, this technology, but backed up with 27 pages of footnote to document how that's not what you know, Singer and Cole dreamed up. Here's what the research shows you. Here, if you want to go you know, learn more about it, you can extend it. And it goes back to that idea of um, hopefully people will be entertained, but also educated. One of the biggest things we learned from Ghost Fleet is that um, uh, you know, the bottom line is people are more likely to read a, a fun summer novel than, um, and recommend it to someone else than you know, a, a PowerPoint or a white paper. Um, doesn't mean there's not a utility of nonfiction. That's why we've woven it in, but that you can also you know, communicate in other ways and achieve that goal of policy influence and public understanding. That's so, Peter, thank you, because I was actually going to ask you about the concept of a novel with footnotes, which, which I, I do think is a, a very powerful way of conveying this information. I mean, it, we have seen a major move toward narrative nonfiction. So people who used to write nonfiction wrote books that were maybe slightly more popular versions of academic books, but they didn't tell stories. They were full of analysis. And now New America supports 15 fellows every year and they write mostly nonfiction books, but they're books full of stories, the way journalists will hook you in uh, with a story. And th this is the flip of it. And it is very powerful because you live with those characters. I'm only about a third of the way through. I'm actually reading it uh, every night. And uh, I already find, for instance, that early on, there's a scene uh, with one of the main characters. And August, I'm about to ask you about how you come up with these characters. But Keegan, the, the woman who's a Marine, a uh, former Marine FBI agent, the, the, one of the central characters, is at Union Station. And she is getting all this data coming through with sort of the the version that you all footnote is a version of what you might think of as Google Glass of stuff coming in. And so much is coming in that she actually has to shut it off to be able to, to do what she needs to do in that situation. I won't, I won't sp any spoilers. But that is so much more alive to me than any number of things I've written, including by you, Peter. I mean, <laughs> you know, and other, other lots of, of, of people in, in uh, the defense community and the security community writing about the kinds of data we'll be able to get. And some, some uh, cars already have this kind of data coming on their windshields, but you're like living it and realizing what it would be. But let me, let me then turn to sort of the novelist craft and the analyst craft, because the two of you put them together. Uh, and August, how do, you, how, did you, how do you start? Talk about the process. How did you come up with these characters? Uh, because, you know, like any good fiction writer, you have to have a character who's believable uh, and that you can live, live with for, you know, 300 pages. You know, that's a great point. I mean, you have to get to the end of the book. You know, that's a first order yeah. challenge for any, for any writer. And the, this character driven aspect of stories that can also be a form of useful fiction, I think is elemental. Uh, if we can't relate or identify with some aspect, even our villains, uh, then we're not necessarily gonna connect with the larger themes and, and underlying you know, currents in a, in, a, in, a, in a narrative, like especially one as long as a novel, but it's also true for, for short stories. So in the case of Burn In, you know, each character is representative in many ways of either multiple or discrete uh, trends that we identify today as being determinant in shaping parts of society. And an example would be our special agent, Laura Keegan, who, as you said, has a very utilitarian approach to technology, which is uh, based off of her experience as a, as a combat uh, Marine uh, who worked with small robots uh, on different deployments. And does not have the sort of utopian view of technology, but she's neither dystopian per se either, but she knows the limits in life or death situations, which I think is a great way to try to understand when we're in this world of literally limitless data, when machine learning and, and other forms of AI are essentially processing and helping us make sense of it 
but that too can be too much. And sometimes that gut instinct, which is something that people in law enforcement particularly often do uh, rely on as they do in other fields, it's something that we wanted to kind of keep at front and center with her, that there's a human dimension to how she understands and makes sense of her world. The interesting aspect to that, though, is that technology in Berlin, as Pete was describing, is not evenly distributed in Washington. In that scene where they're rushing to uh, prevent a crime from happening, you know, each federal agency and local law enforcement are essentially working with different you know, species of AI and, and similar systems. You know, the, the, the utopian notion of you know, fused networks uh, and, and you know, seamless movement of data back and forth has been you know, the sort of, I mean, that's truly science fiction. And we just haven't seen that in our, in our uh, you know, acquisitions at the government level for, for the last, you know, 30 years of trying. But Laura Keegan's husband uh, is a really interesting character too, because he represents the rise of the gig economy and the inability uh, due to algorithmic outsourcing at very high levels, uh, uh, or very fields that require high levels of education, like let's say law. So he worked at a white shoe law firm in DC and had his position replaced by an algorithm. So somebody who went to the right schools, who did what they thought were, quote unquote, all the right things, is now in a position where they have no economic freedom or choice. You know, they're essentially forced to take gig work just to, if anything, go through the, the act of working. And in fact, doing something that could be automated itself. Uh, but there's a small premium paid for human contact in the sort of service that he does virtually from home. And that, to me, is a really profound uh, factor, you know, element of the book, where, you know, the, the discourse on automation and job replacement is often talked about happening to other people than those who write these reports. But yet when you look at many of the breakthroughs that are happening with, with uh, neural network computing and AI, for example, where you can replace somebody like me who, who writes fiction, right? With a kind of synthetic uh, you know, personality, if you will, that can create content that could be as gripping as anything that I could, that I could imagine. And so you know, feel, seeing how already you're looking at Wall Street, looking at the legal profession, have these technological uh, forces kind of course through and replace people with algorithms. I think you're seeing a real underappreciated uh, dynamic in the political system too, because somebody who feels uh, like they have been uh, essentially betrayed by a, a system that they've given everything to is going to be very angry. I think that can lead to a rise of populism and other forms of forms of politics uh, that that can be very dangerous, uh, even even beyond where we are today with those same threats. So that was a, a really interesting manifestation of a of a significant trend in the form of a character who's central to the story. I have to say, as a former law professor who uh, I taught law for 12 years and I taught lots and lots of students who really looked like that character and I could, I really could imagine, you know, you go through the law school, you pay, take on the debt, you go to a firm, you think you've done it all right and there he is on the couch. Uh, and indeed, in, in one of the books I wrote, uh, on women, men, work, and family. I have a chapter that, that's titled, Is Managing Kids Harder Than Managing Money? Well, even in 2015, people said, oh, that's ridiculous. Of course, managing money is harder. But that's clearly not going to be true. I don't even think it's true now because you manage money with algorithms and that's going to continue. Whereas thus far anyway, managing kids is plenty hard and technology is a, a downside. Um, and Peter, that leads me to you, because one of the things that is very powerful in the book is that you are paying a lot of attention uh, to the, the, this couple's internal uh, dynamic. Uh, and they have a daughter, and he's lost his law firm job. She's really the primary breadwinner. Talk, so you all are, you're two men. <laughs> uh, you've written about uh, a, a main character who's a woman. Uh, and then her relationship, and you're flipping the dynamic of many relationships, although you're definitely tapping into the kind of bumps uh, in, in our, many of our relationships. How did you think about that? How did that, that did you talk to women? Did you, how did you figure that out? So it, the great thing about these projects is you're pulling in from both um, fiction and nonfiction influences and one's weaving across to the other. Um, for us, the main character of Keegan, um, as we thought about the character more and more and the world that they were in, um, and I'm going to steal a phrase from August here, you know, essentially her face was the one looking back at us more and more as we uh, uh, thought it through. Um, and then also in turn, 
the spouse's character, his face was the one that came back. But the, you know, the origin of um, actually his character was um, from this nonfiction report side. We, you know, we built a, um, we, we pulled every single uh, job automation report we could find, you know, from the think tanks, um, from McKinsey and PricewaterhouseCoopers to World Bank to Oxford University. There's actually a, a spreadsheet that was built that has over 1,300 of these different projections out there. And, you know, so in, in there and, you know, everything from, you know, one group's is a 35 page report, another's is a 200 page report. So we brought it all together and you could see the sort of the estimates of what it would do to different professions. You know, so Oxford University looked at um, 702 different professions and found that 47% of unemployment's at risk. Um, but the way, and it goes back to your earlier question, the way it became real to us was not the data point of 47%, it was making this character someone in a profession that most people don't think will be automated, um, a, a contract law, and then exploring, okay, what does that do to their marriage? What does that do to their parenting? What does that do to their self-identity and the politics of it? That makes it real in a certain way. Um, but also, you know, the, what makes, I think, Keegan real is that she's like the rest of us. And again, this comes from, um, you know, our own lives from interviewing people, she's juggling identities. So there's the moment uh, she comes home uh, very early on and she, you know, has that sort of, I've got to get out of work mode and I got to get in parenting mode. Um, and she's have her marriage is falling apart and she doesn't know whether it's going to be one of those nights or not. Yeah. And, you know, that balancing act is something that we all go through. And I think it makes her certainly um, feel more realized than, um, frankly, the depiction that you see typically of uh, female characters in techno thrillers. Um, and so hopefully that resonates. And so you get those kind of influences. And, you know, uh, sometimes it's from interviews. It's the same thing when you think about the, you know, not small moments, but, but big scenes. Um, the interviews sometimes are incredibly revealing. Uh, you know, I don't want to plot spoil too much, but someone who worked on the water systems of Washington, D.C. revealed to us um, actually how to uh, recreate portions of the 1936 flood uh, for people who want to see imagery online of what that would look like. That came from interviews. So that's, you know, oh, wow, that's an inspirational scene as opposed to how do we want to communicate it. And then um, different from the nonfiction side is that all um, writers are readers too. Um, and so we're, we're influenced by uh, what we read, what we love, what we enjoy. And sometimes it might be, you know, like I said, readers, novels, books that we enjoy, um, characters that we enjoy. Other times it might be even um, movies. Uh, there's a scene um, in the book that literally came from um, August and I talking about what we particularly appreciated about Tarantino movies. And it ah. was the small, they're, they're, you know, everyone doesn't remember the big scenes. They remember the, the small moment where, you know, a character sort of tells a story. Um, and even if that character only appeared in that one scene, that sticks with you. And so we, you know, we try and capture that in the storytelling as well. So, you know, sometimes we're pulling from Excel spreadsheets, sometimes interviews, sometimes, you know, people or interactions or moments or even what we observe around us. And you're really weaving it all together. I was actually struck by uh, thinking about the movie Her. All of us are watching lots of movies uh, in, uh, in my household. My husband prefers things that are in Japanese or German or that are black and white with atonal music and qualify as high art. I, on the other hand, often want to completely decompress. We compromised on Her, and I won't plot spoil, but that's another really great way of living the future and and a, a very different narrative again than the ro robots rise and then they take over. Uh, you so know, it, it, it also shows um, something that uh, in fiction, just like with pictures, sometimes you can tell more with, you know, a couple sentences exactly. than you could with an entire white paper. So there's a moment um, in, in our book where Keegan first meets her uh the new system that she's doing a burn-in on tams which is a robotic system and it speaks to her in a female voice and tams is basically siri or alexa move forward okay. combined with you know boston dynamics you know robots that you see youtube's of move forward but so it speaks to her with a female voice and she's like no no no, no. 
reprogram. We're not doing that. And, yes. and it, and it, and it, <laughs> that moment tells you everything about her, but it also makes you reflect on, you know, the strange ways that we genderize our robots and everything that's sort of packed into that. So, and, it, and we don't need a whole, you know, essay on it. It's just a little moment that tells you something about your character and also about an issue that we've got to figure out. Exactly. So August, that's, uh, tell us about being the ghost in the machine. Because so TAMS, right, you can talk about what TAMS stands for. TAMS is another central character. This is a book about AI visualized. TAM is, TAMS is AI visualized, but you, you're writing a book about a machine who is a character. So when I said, you're the ghost of the machine, you have to get inside the machine and, and basically make it human enough uh, that we can identify, but we can also still see ourselves interacting with something that is not human. So just talk about that. Talk about the character. You know, the, the human robot relationship is, has been so expertly written about and, and done in films like, like Spike Jones's Her, like you said, that, you know, part of the challenge was how to, how to create something that would feel different, but, but authentic still to the world that we built. And I think this is also an aspect of being a collaborator and having a co-writer where you can avoid you know, some of the blind spots or pitfalls that you might fall into in trying to build an authentic uh, relationship between a human and a machine. And so in the, in the machine that is TAMS, as Pete said, it's not the sort of, uh, you know, titanic, you know, enormous Terminator type robot that, you know, walks down the street and everybody runs the other way. It's quite diminutive. It, in fact, reflects a lot of our thinking and, and exploration of what military robotics may more likely be like, which are smaller, far smaller than, than are often depicted in popular uh, narratives. And, and particularly given, given Keegan's work, that was a really, I think, a critical part of her understanding of what it would be like to relate to a robot and, and there's this aspect of trust that you have to, I think, make central to any human machine relationship. And, uh, you know, this is of course, you know, core to the current, you know, thinking in the defense department with human, you know, on the loop and in the loop, the, these dynamics that are really, really difficult to unpack in different situations, depending on how the technology is used. But for us, we, we had a, a, a relationship and a, a story that allowed us to, I think, in a pretty obvious way, show the evolution of a relationship because any novel or really any story, whether we tell it or whether we write it, has to have you know change in our characters, and what's yeah. interesting about a, a mechanical one that has software as its you know soul, if you will, is that it has none of the elements really that make us you know human in, in the pure sense, but yet we can relate to its quirks, to the ways that its programming gives it almost personality because of the ways that in fact much of the software that is out there today that is going to shape how we relate to robotics will of course reflect what its creators uh, believe, think, the biases they have. Uh, and that al also becomes an issue, I think, from the educational part of Burn that we don't want people to be aware of, is that, you know, technology is not omnipotent and nor is it perfect just because it works flawlessly. Uh, you know, the data that you put into it, the, the, the programming parameters, et cetera, uh, are going to influence the, the ultimate sort of utility and whether something is, you know, quote unquote, good or bad. And so the, the human, you know, robot relationship between uh, Laura Keegan and, and TAMS, this, you know, tactical autonomous mobility system. I was Originally, trying to remember what it was, tactical <laughs> autonomous mobility system. Okay. <laughs> Originally, uh, can I, I don't know if I can say this, Pete, but the robot was called August and we had a whole acronym for that, but we decided for <laughs> obvious reasons we couldn't do that. Um, I don't know what that says about Pete's opinion of me, but you know, we'll just, we'll just leave that out there for, for everyone to decide. But, uh, but I'll, I'll let Pete kind of finish maybe describing the, the thinking and the, the kind of layering approach we took to developing that relationship. Terrific. Well, one of the other things is um, important is, um, not just to get on the nonfiction side, but but every fiction um, has a larger theme, a larger message, you know, so um, Moby Dick is not really a story about a hunt for a whale, right? And the two... Um, not? Two, yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> I won't spoil what happens in the end. Um, but uh, that there's two particular themes that, that we were exploring in both the fictional side, but important themes on the non-fictional side. The first is this notion of trust and that trust has two different meanings. There's the um, way we normally think about trust, our interpersonal relationships. I trust you. I find you trustworthy. But there's the way that um, engineers think about trust, which is that it works as predicted. Um, so for example, I can um, trust 
that someone is a pathological liar and know that they will always lie and then operate in an effective manner in a world that has that understanding, right? So what we see in the book is this exploration of um, first, uh, what is it like to be in America where both of these ideals of trust are under siege by both natural and deliberate forces. Um, something again, we can feel swirling around us. What does that also look like in the relationship in the family, but also between human and machine? And then the second theme coming out of this is this notion of, um, as Keegan says at one point, you know, you, you can't fight the future. Um, but what you can figure out is um, what is your role in it? And so there's this exploration of what they call human machine teaming. And, um, you know, rather than, again, how sci-fi depicts it of one singular type of robot, there's lots of different forms of robotics out there, AI that are out there. There's lots of different ways of thinking about the teaming. Um, it might be tasking the robot out. It might be the robots like the equivalent of a police dog. It might be the robots like what's been called the robot wingman program by um, the Pentagon. It might be the robot as a advisor, a concierge-like system. They call them decision aids. But one, you have all these different forms that we need to understand, but really what it's all about is figuring out what's the best role for the human, what's the best role for the machine, but also within that relationship, how is the human reshaping the machine? Because they're not just a regular technology, they're always learning. And so you have sort of mass scale surveillance learning, and then you have the what every parent feels, you know, the, the kid is watching you. And so when it has these quirks, it's because, you know, that was the way it was programmed um, or it observed. But then you also have the notion of um, how is the human, how is the machine changing the way the human acts, both towards other humans, but also towards machines themselves. And, you know, again, this is, it, this is right for exploration and, and sci-fi, a different kind of discussion, but it's also, you know, if we want to talk about the future of jobs in America, uh, that idea of, you know, what's the role for the human versus the machine, you want to talk about the role of robotics and policing or in military, same questions play out. And so we need to understand and we need to have a good vocabulary for them. Yeah, that is, that is really fascinating. We're going to turn to, to audience questions because we've got a lot of great ones, but any parent has had the experience of driving and having a young child in the back uh, and suddenly, you know, you break and the child says something about the other driver that is not repeatable and you realize, you know, they are learning from you. You are looking in a mirror and it forces you to really examine what you're teaching them, right? And they hear things you want them to hear and things they don't, but it is, and in, in that sense, this adaptive software is that process, but but much more focus where they really, the only way they're gonna learn is from interacting with you because they're not surrounded by lots of other things. So it, it, it does bring that dimension uh, to the fore in an extraordinary way. So we have a bunch of great questions. I'm gonna ask uh, one of you to take each one so we can get through many. And the first one uh, with, from Alan Buck is, can you talk about the development of the related playlist? It really added to the experience and setting of each scene. And I did not realize there was an associated playlist. So talk about it. Uh, that's on, everyone. All right, that you? That, that's on me. I've actually done that for um, uh, most of my books. Uh, and it's the idea that um, there are either scenes that are um, influenced by a certain song or uh, capture the moment. Um, uh, and so, you know, what, and we should be clear, these are not favorite songs. They're just scenes. Sometimes they're, they're songs that actually play in the, in the, in the book itself. Um, there's a creepy scene that has appropriate enough nine inch nails playing in it. Um, there's another scene where uh, it's a Sesame Street song that gets recast in a way that's, I think, kind of heartbreaking. Um, and so we have the page numbers there that you can play them or it might be a scene where there's just a line a lyric that's like wow that really captures uh what that character is saying or doing i think it's fun i think it adds something more um and you know hopefully people in, in, enjoy it that's great so that's you're really a a multimedia creator peter i mean I, I i i don't know if it's 1984 or brave new world that talks about surround sound but you're clearly thinking of in terms of surround sound 
it's one of those. Um, so the next question, August, maybe you want to take this one, is with hundreds of real world predictions in the book, which do you think is the coolest or the scariest? I think I'll, I'll start with the, the scariest because we're talking about uh, dystopias and, and probably all feeling a bit dystopian today. You know, I, I really do worry about this exacerbated socioeconomic uh, condition of the country that is not going to improve with the implementation of AI and robotics. Uh, I feel like as a society, we have a lot of healing and, and work to be doing, uh, whether it comes to race, whether it comes to economic injustice. And uh, that process is uh, gonna be very, very challenging to, to do with the sorts of stressors that, that we can unleash if we are unwise about how we start to, to do uh, the sorts of, of automation that, that it, as Pete said, feels almost inevitable. And, and as Keegan, our character, is trying to figure out what is, what is her role within all that. Um, you know, as far as, as the exciting technologies, you know, that's a really interesting question because there is a duality, of course, to every invention. Um, you know, I mean, there are there are parts of me that think it would be great to walk into a coffee shop and have my coffee read uh, ready for me because the machine learning algorithm in the, the shop recognizes me and knows what I like to order and maybe even based on my mood could detect that. I'm also horrified by that loss of agency to pick, you know, a cappuccino versus a whatever regular coffee in a given day. Uh, you know, so I think there are some very pedestrian examples in the book that I think can, can be really important in having people understand the ways that that we we have this this dual edged uh, aspect to the kinds of innovations that are going to be presented to us whether we're ready or not and and i think the kind of social conversations the societal conversations i guess i should say uh, that need to happen about the the rightness or the or the, the timeliness um, because this this could versus should conversation hasn't been had enough in the technology community and i believe that it's imperative that we start having it uh, in a very acute way uh, because of the, the stakes that are rising in, in the political realm, like right now, uh, but also economically too, because of the because of the pandemic. When those two collide, uh, I'm extremely worried that we may be past a point of no return and create a situation that's very hard to, to, to unwind. Now that is one that all of us in national security also think about because, uh, you know, chemical weapons were only outlawed after uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people died of being gassed in World War I, and nuclear weapons were only outlawed after we dropped two in World War II, and we really don't want to have to have that demonstration of the catastrophe that awaits before we decide maybe we shouldn't. Um, so Peter, there's a question that is, I think is perfect for you. Uh, it says, Burnin highlights the importance of embedding technologists in the policy process. Can you speak to existing initiatives that are uh, lack, uh, tackling that issue head on? And I will say that I loved the shout out to public interest technology in, as I've gotten that far in the book. <laughs> so uh, public interest technology is a, a program at New America that um, is trying to do what um, we've seen play out in fields like medicine or um, law where you know, if you go back in law at one point, you had people that either um, worked in the private sector uh, or they worked for government. And then you know, starting about a generation back, you started to see lawyers being able to take a third path, which would be to work in civil society for you know, a nonprofit, an aid group, whatever it is. Um, there's an idea of trying to create uh, forms of this, both for civil society, for technology, technologists to aid civil society, but also, to create different kinds of pathways into government. Um, uh, there's been a couple little startup initiatives like that. There was one um, in the Obama era that you know, started with the healthcare.com, you know, not good rollout, but then brought in tech talent to aid them and said, okay, can we make this a little bit more permanent? There's another program within the Pentagon um, to start up a nugget of that for uh, AI. Um, the Joint AI Center is an example what I hope is that um, we get truly creative about it. You know, so one idea, uh, for instance, is that you have an entry point into the military, um, not bottom up, but from the side for uh, doctors, for lawyers, for chaplains, uh, and they are assigned to be supportive to different units uh, and they move across those units. Uh, so a chaplain might aid an engineering unit or it might aid a infantry unit or a Navy ship we can think about data scientists as that. Um, and that may be something to think about of bringing new folks in, um, having to be creative to catch up to uh, the new job skills that are needed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'll we should add, sorry, that one of the characters in the book is um, an example 
of that, where it's someone who specializes in human machine working together. And that is clearly going to be a need, whether uh, it's a government agency or it's a private company. Yep. And I'll also add that New America hosts Tech Congress, which puts, puts technologists in Congress. And we certainly have seen what uh, lack of knowledge of technology for good or and for ill uh, has done in the lawmaking process, you know, where you have senators asking Mark Zuckerberg how Facebook makes its money. That is, that is not uh, the kind, you know, the, what we want to see where we need to regulate a lot of this technology. And indeed, there's now uh, the beginnings of a U.S. digital service in Congress, because it's really all branches of government. Uh, I remember when Larry Lessig was a uh, clerk on the Supreme Court for uh, Justice Scalia, uh, several decades ago and he was one of the first people to kind of get the Supreme Court on the internet. So we, we, need, we, we need a lot more of that work. So we have a question here that I will put to both of you. Um, and then the, uh, it says, since we can assume that all policymakers will be buying and reading a burn-in with the same enthusiasm uh, that they've read Ghost Fleet, uh, what would you like the ultimate takeaway uh, to be to, to consider for people to consider uh, as they look at new strategy development in the next decade? And August, I'll let you start. I assume you probably sure. eat different things. You know, I think I would like somebody who reads this who's in a position of, of uh, leadership, whether it's in government or, or the technology sector or other, other parts of society, to, to in effect feel like we're not ready for the future and that we have a lot of work to do uh, at many different levels that there is a, an appreciation, of course, for the great potential for artificial intelligence for robotics, but how we implement them uh, is as important as whether we do or not. You know, you can look at the surveys of, uh, for example, CEOs who are, you know, extremely interested in implementing a technology like this, but when you start to ascertain what, what they actually understand about AI, the, the percentage is quite low. And so to me, you know, this aspect of education and offering some familiarity with these concepts with these use cases with these pitfalls that that go with them not in the discrete technological sense but in a much more holistic like societal way yeah. then we're we're forewarned i think and forearmed for uh, avoiding some of the dystopian aspects of, of this of this story that we wrote great peter so for me it's um two things and, and it's again very different than the approach of uh you know, um, and even you, Emory, were sort of, you know, trying not to give away too much. And, you know, if right. it was a nonfiction, we would have, you know, the bottom line up front. And then at the end of the book, we would have the PowerPoint, you know, bullet points of here's what you can do. Um, this is not that. And uh, I think, you know, for me, there's, there's two core takeaways. One is um, to put the numbers behind what August was mentioning, you know, a survey uh, among leaders found that 91% think um, AI uh, is the key technology to the future. We see it woven into everything from the U.S. national defense strategy to pretty much every Fortune 500 company says this is the key to our future. Right. And yet, yet um, only 17% self-report that they have a passing familiarity with it, let alone its applications, et cetera. So I hope we give um, people uh, the vocabulary to understand the key issues and concepts only then can you have an effective debate about it. To use that parallel of, you can't have a debate about the role of social media if you don't even understand how Facebook works. You may not agree on the sides of the debate, but you gotta have the basic vocabulary. So hopefully we give people in a, you know, um, I, I've joked that we're, we're parents, so we're, we're sneaking fruit and veggies into the smoothie. <laughs> hopefully we're giving people that vocabulary of applications, terms that they get not by, you know, they're not going to go read an academic paper on it. And again, it might be AI, it might be algorithmic bias, you name it. The second thing is um, the narrative. If there is some moment in it that scared you, that you didn't like, maybe it's a little tiny point, maybe it's a large scene, whatever that nightmare scenario is. One, here's the footnote to show, hey, it actually could be real. But two, it is still set in the future you have agency to change it, to keep that nightmare scenario from coming true. So if it's keeping you up at night, you can solve that problem. Yeah. That, again, I think this is where this form is so effective because 
you can read about an apocalypse as a prediction or you can live it, which again, science fiction in various ways, novels, literature, I mean, they are ways of exploring our world that make them deeply vivid and memorable to us. Uh, and it, it, it is so vital in an area of technology that is arcane for so many of us. So the la there are, there, there's one last question uh, and it, they, I'm gonna roll it together with another. So the, the question is, um, what is the next issue that the two of you are planning to tackle? What is the next book topic? Uh, and in particular, uh, there's a question from Jeffrey Wilson that says, has the COVID crisis inspired you to write uh, anything on viruses or biological warfare? So again, August, I'll start with you and, and with Peter. We're, uh, we're always talking about next ideas and concepts. And, and the important thing is we came out of this collaboration like good friends still, and also really enjoying work, working together. That, that's a good first order test. Uh, so, so we can continue to collaborate in the future and, and more is on the way. Um, you know, on the, on the bio side, it's an incredibly important area. And, and I look at some of the, the work out there on the nonfiction side um, and fictional side, you know, one of my friends, Jamie Metzl has done some excellent work on that. Uh, you know, my, my belief is that, is that, you know, the world in Berlin is a fusion of a lot of different technologies together. And whether it's uh, elements like climate change and global warming that are present in the book uh, is part of the authentic world building for, you know, 10 to 15 to 20 years out, you have to start considering that uh, as being an, in, a really powerful force, uh, just as we're talking about AI and, and robotics. Uh, so there's a lot of work to, to be done on that for sure. And, and that's something I would be incredibly interested in, in pursuing. Great. Peter, last word. <laughs> on the what are we writing next, the, yeah. the great thing of um, this space is uh, unlike the US military, August and I have op security. So <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to share everything, but um, I will say what that person put their, their finger on is something notable. Um, there is a, uh, and it's referenced, um, it was referenced in the original project that, that the proposal for this book. Um, it was a uh, US national intelligence community report looking at the world of the 2030s and it said there were um, three key trends that were going to be different than what we'd seen before. Um, one was uh, great power rivalry with a true political and economic and technological competitor in China uh, and you see the world of Ghost Fleet. The second was they described um, these domestic forces of uh, disarray, division, um, and described it as equivalent to, quote, sitting on a volcano, and Burnin explores that a little bit. And the third was um, all of the incredible breakthroughs that we've seen in um, uh, biosciences and genomics. And so that questioner put their, their finger on trends that have uh, fascinated us, uh, certainly, and, and, but are very complex trends that, again, we think require um, new ways of communicating real research on them. That's great. So it is one o'clock. Uh, I want to thank both of you. I want to remind everybody that the novel is called Burn In, a novel of the real robotic revolution. And you can get it uh, at our, our book partner, Solid State Books, and also at other independent bookstores and anywhere you buy books. Uh, and I want to thank also our fabulous events team, uh, Angela Spiedelet uh, and McKinley Lutz, both of whom have made this possible. Uh, behind the scenes, you don't see them or hear them, are Jason Stewart and Shannon Lynch. So with thanks to everybody at New America who made this possible, thanks to all of, the, to all of you in the audience. Your questions were terrific. We could have gone on for another half hour easily, but I am going to release you to your day with uh, thanks. And really, I can't wait to finish the book.